Hello and welcome to this short clip on transition metals as catalysts. We'll look at some common examples of transition metals, specifically from the first order of the D block, so uh, with the, the 3D subshell being the um, orbitals being filled, and the industrial chemical processes that they catalyze, with a brief look at the reasons why transition elements are good catalysts. And I'm going to make sure that I don't extend anything beyond A level so it can be used as a guide to the degree to which you need to have an appreciation of uh, transition metal catalysis as opposed to a deeper level understanding. So if we look at this, uh, this graph it's straight out of first year chemistry, the idea is that catalysts act by lowering the amount of energy required for a reaction to start. Uh, they achieve this by temporarily getting involved in the reaction before being regenerated by the end. So as you can see, an alternative reaction route of lower activation energy is provided by the catalyst. What it doesn't do is change the original activation energy of the uncatalyzed reaction. That's sometimes a misconception that creeps in here. What it does is it offers an alternative reaction route that itself has a lower activation energy. This means the original activation energy of uncatalyzed reaction remains fixed. But the EC is in the diagram, the activation energy of a catalyzed route is lower than the original, so it happens preferentially. So we can also illustrate this using a Boltzmann graph from first year chemistry, and as you can see quite clearly, the catalyzed reaction's activation energy um, shifts left. So in other words, EC is less than EA. So what's this got to do with transition metals? Why are transmit transition metals so good at doing this? So to fully understand this, you've got to look at what happens at atom and orbital level. So transition elements have unfilled 3D orbitals and therefore can exist in more than one stable oxidation state. Different elements exhibit this to different degrees for reasons beyond the specification. So I just want to clarify, when I say unfilled 3D orbitals, obviously if you were to look at other transition elements that are in the D block, you could have ones in the 4D or the 5D um, uh, row as well. So it's not just the top row, it's uh, all of the, uh, potentially all of the transition elements can exhibit this, but some of them exhibit it to greater degrees than others. So the idea is that if a transition element can exist in at least two oxidation states, then it can potentially act as a catalyst for the right reaction. So we've got um, six possible candidates in the top row of the D block, in the 3D um, subshell, that could do this for us. And we're going to look at some of them in a little bit closer detail. So for the purpose of this, of this clip, I'm going to focus on heterogeneous catalysis which basically means that the catalyst and the substrate are in different physical states. So the blue dots represent positions where electrons from the substrate and transition metal d orbitals can interact. So if we take ethanol as a substrate, just as an example, you can see that the bond length of the carbon-oxygen bond matches the distance between two of the points. So if there's an interaction that goes on, that could possibly lead to the removal of that H2O. And that could rearrange the atoms into an ethene molecule and a water molecule, for example. So that means that that's, that catalyst is specific to this reaction because the bond lengths in the substrate match the distances between the points in the catalyst bed where interactions from the substrate and the transition metal d electrons can actually occur. So this animation shows nickel behaving as a catalyst because it has three stable oxidation states. So we'll try and talk you through the animation as it plays. So we have ethene absorbed onto the surface, the bond length being carbon and carbon matches the points in the nickel catalyst. That allows the bonds to break because the electrons in the pi bond of the carbon, uh, the carbon-carbon double bond, get involved with the d orbitals in nickel, and therefore that allows the ethene to be broken up to form ethane, and ethane can escape 
as the, uh, the new product. And you'll notice that at some point um, now it mentioned the bonds breaking forming a complex. That complex is what actually occurs in the um, the energy level diagram we looked at a little bit earlier, the enthalpy profile diagram. So in the diagram from earlier, I've added an extra level uh, where I've put the nickel ethene intermediate. So uh, this is where the actual combination occurs. So here's some examples at A level you might want to remember that you'll be asked to quote. You're generally allowed to quote any of them that you want, as long as you can remember a couple of examples um, of transition metal um, uh, elements being used as catalysts. So remember, at all times, it, we're talking about heterogeneous catalysis, meaning uh, the catalyst is solid and the substrates tend to be gases that pass over it and get involved in the way that the animation showed a couple of seconds ago. So this shows carbon monoxide reacting with a, uh, a catalyst bed in a car catalytic converter. So we've got the actual reaction that's being catalyzed there. It's the reaction between two moles of carbon monoxide, two moles of nitrogen monoxide to make two CO2s and one mole of nitrogen. The products there are far less environmentally damaging and far less toxic than the reactants. So in fact, under European law, in the last 20 years, all cars sold across Europe must have been fitted with one of these three-way catalytic converters for environmental reasons. So let's have a look at um, something called catalyst specificity. This is a slight extension topic. It's in some A-level specifications, but not all. So not all catalysts obviously act on all substrates in the same way not all enzymes act on all substrates. Some might bind too strongly and therefore not releasing the product you want, whilst others might bind too weakly and therefore the correct intermediate species won't form in the first place. Let's look at an example. So looking at this demonstration, we've got some hydrogen peroxide. You can see, if you look closely, that there's some bubbles forming already. This is due to the oxygen being given off, that you can see in the equation top right of the screen. So I'm going to try and catalyse this, this reaction a bit by using iron 3 oxide. I know the label said iron 2, but it's actually iron 3 oxide. And I'm also going to try and catalyse it using MnO2. And you'll see from when you look at it that MnO2 is far more effective. So adding some iron 3 oxide, you can see that there's not too much activity taking place. I bring the tube a little bit closer to the screen so you can have a look and note there's not much happening just yet. If we now add some manganese oxide, MnO2, in oxidation state 4, the gas I'm trying to test for is oxygen, so I'm going to be lighting a splint so you can see me getting that ready in the background. So the first thing to do is to double check the Fe2O3. It's bubbling a little bit more now, I don't know if you can see from the screen, but take it from me, it had started to react a bit by then. So now the third tube, um, bottom right hand corner of the screen within the screen, you can see quite clearly that it reacts a lot more aggressively, a lot more, a lot more quickly, so that means that manganese dioxide is more effective. So now what we do is we test the oxygen that's being uh, supposedly given off, just to confirm that it's oxygen, using the uh, the glowing splint test. So I've got to put out the flame, give it a little shake, and you can see clearly that it relights by itself. That's due to the presence of greater amounts of oxygen in the tube. And just to confirm the identity of the uh, substrate, I'll show you the bottle. Hydrogen peroxide, 50 volume, quite concentrated. So we're going to add a little bit more of it now, just to show that the catalyst is regenerated, so it hasn't been used up. It's not just a black residue there, it's still MnO2. And it's just as lively as it was before. So we're just going to pop the lid back on our stock bottle, put it back in the tray. 
Now we can talk about what might be happening. So we've got several oxidation states that each of those two metals exist in. And like we said before, the variation in oxidation states is what allows transition metals to behave as good catalysts. And we also talked before about the idea of the orientation or the, um, the catalyst bed, the surface of the solid catalyst, interacting with, uh, with molecules that were coming near to it. So if we look at MnO2 and Fe2O3 and we put um, identical H2O2 molecules nearby them, you can see that the points on the surface at which the um, orbital electrons can in, in, uh, interact with the, um, with the molecule, the substrate molecule, are differently spaced. The spacing of the, bonding, of the bond lengths is uh, exactly the same as the spacing of the MnO2 uh, points of interaction, but they're not quite the same in the case of Fe2O3, so that could be a possible reason for what you've just seen. Mm. Now, the exact mechanism by which this takes place is, uh, is fairly complicated, I'm not even sure I fully understand it myself, so I'm not going to try um, and integrate it into this clip, because, like we said earlier, the clip is mainly about A-level, um, not A-level extension or even university level. So the main thing to take from this, I suppose, is the fact that, that catalysis is specific between substrates and catalysts, and it could be uh, associated with the common stable oxidation states in which the transition metal catalyst actually exists. So in a minute we're going to be looking at uh, a recap on the, uh, the energy profile diagram we talked about, but just to clarify, more oxidation states means better catalytic activity. Better catalytic activity. So just slightly adjust my a little box in the corner there, so it actually says what it's meant to say. More oxidation states, better catalytic activity. So let's have another quick look at the enthalpy profile diagram. So we're going to start by looking at the uncatalyzed route. Now, as you'd expect from a standard enthalpy profile diagram, you have an activation energy that reaches the highest energy level for that particular reaction. Just realised I'd. Uh, outgrown my x my y axis a bit so I had to just extend it there, cheat a little bit. Okay, so where was I? Yeah. Reactants have a higher energy than the product, so this is a an exothermic reaction. It would obviously be the other way around for an endothermic one. So now let's look at the uncatalyzed sorry, the catalyzed route, beg your pardon. So you can see that the activation energy for the catalyzed route, we'll call it E C, is a lot smaller than the activation energy for the uncatalyzed route. So now we've got, what we've got to do is label up what actually exists at each stage. So what you have in the middle is a reactant catalyst intermediate. So what's going on here is that the reactants are interacting with the d orbitals, the electrons and the d orbitals of the catalyst transition metal. So let's have a look now at a specific industrial example. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to look at a specific example, which is the contact process. You don't need to remember the exact details, um, but the fact that it uses vanadium pentoxide, or V2O5, is a useful one, because you can see the changes in the oxidation state for vanadium. And the thing that you might get asked to do is to prove that, using these two steps, vanadium is acting as a catalyst. So not just that it's regenerated at the end, the fact that it changes and then changes back. So it's worth looking at the fact that the step 1 happens twice because step 2 required two V2O4s to work to make two moles of V2O5. So this is the reason in the overall equation with the catalytic species cancelled you actually end up with two moles of SO3. So let's now look at a, an A-level style question that's on the contact process. So. Like I said, you don't have to remember the exact details, but um, it's useful to think about what it means by the single overall equation. We've just mentioned the overall equation is actually the reaction between the sulfur dioxide and oxygen. So we can represent it in that way, like just like we looked at. So the next part of the question, moving the page down, obviously asks us to draw on the axes 
labelled reaction profiles for both the uncatalyzed and the catalyzed reactions. So it's an enthalpy profile diagram, a bit like before. So we start by a straightforward enthalpy profile diagram with the activation energy for the for the, for the uncatalyzed, I meant to write up there, the uncatalyzed route. Uh, so you have your reactants at a slightly higher level of energy than your product. So we put in our um, catalyst, our transition state species, and also our final catalyst regenerated in a different colour. So you can see clearly here that the EC value is uh, smaller than the original EA. So just like we talked about earlier, the, cat the catalyzed route occurs by a shorter, sorry, a smaller um, activation energy. So the activation energy for the catalyzed route is lower than the activation energy for the uncatalyzed route. So the next few bits of the question are fairly straightforward. It's obviously heterogeneous catalysis because the sulfur dioxide and O2 are both gases, but the V2O5 is a solid and it's variable oxidation states that the vanadium is displaying whilst it's doing this. And although the third process, strictly speaking, isn't an industrial process, it's a reaction that you've looked at or seen. So uh, from our specification, the three industrial processes or chemical reactions in which a transition element or compound of a transition element acts as a catalyst would be the Haber process, um, hydrogenation of alkenes, and decomposition of H2O2. So in the context of this set of questions, obviously you wouldn't mention um, the contact process because it said three other industrial processes. But let's say you had to just mention one um, as a one marker or something like that. I would suggest um, Haber process or hydrogenation of alkenes or um, contact process. So the flashcard you would need to make, probably, to remember this would be the Haber process, contact process, and hydrogenation of alkenes. So if you have those in your, in your long-term memory, you can then whip one of them out as an example of a transition metal behaving as a catalyst. So hopefully you found this clip reasonably interesting and informative, and it helps you see to what extent you need to have an appreciation, if not a full understanding, of how a transition element is a catalyst. So variable oxidation states lead to catalytic activity um, and there's three examples to remember. That's it. The bit about the distance with the bonds matching the distance between the points at which the orbitals interact, that's a bit beyond A level so don't worry about that. So I've just popped up there in pink uh, the fact that transition metals act as catalysts due to variable oxidation state and the three examples that you can see in the box. That's it. Okay, so thanks for listening, and see you soon.